brilliant ideas, powered by Hyundai Motor. The contemporary art world is vibrant and booming as never before. It's a 21st century phenomenon, a global industry in its own right. Brilliant Ideas looks at the artists at the heart of this. Artists with a unique power to astonish, challenge and shock. Push boundaries, ask new questions and see the world afresh. In this programme, Luke Jerram. Luke Jerram is probably the most famous artist you've never heard of. Working mainly in sculpture and large-scale installation, his work has been seen by millions of people across the globe. You may not know his name, but chances are you've come across his artwork and may even have played it. Some of the art projects I make are quite fun. They have a sort of playful element to them. Um, but actually, the, you know, within my practice as an artist, there's, there's multiple narratives and different strands that have been developing over a number of years. So some of my art projects involve science and engineering um, and perception, and others involve sort of music and an interest in sound and a sort of playful public engagement aspect to them as well. I think he's a unique visionary. I think he, um, he always comes up with new ideas. Luke's practice is about perception and human perception. He creates really interesting and engaging artworks that kind of communicate with audiences on many different levels. He is able to take, if you like, sometimes obvious things, but use them in very new and very effective ways. As an artist, I'm quite happy to apply my creativity to anything, really. And by working with specialists, whether it's an engineer or a composer or a glass blower, it means that anything's possible. UK-based artist Luke Jerram is preparing to install Withdrawn, a new work which opens to the public in just a few weeks. You coming on? <laughs> He's collected old fishing boats from around the country and plans to place them deep in the woods outside Bristol, where he lives and works. Withdrawn came as an idea by all the flooding that we had last winter in, in the southwest of England, where you'd see houses underwater and cars floating down um, roads. And I think with those sort of extreme weather events, you end up with this very sublime, almost poetic imagery. And it is awful, but at the same time, they're very strong, powerful images that come out of uh, tsunamis or, or tidal surge. The imagery for a set of fishing boats abandoned or that would have been dumped perhaps in the middle of the woodland came from that kind of experience. The boats will act as a, a venue for all sorts of um, lectures and performances. One of my slight concerns is if people have heard about the project and they go to see the boats in the woods, there may be a percentage of the population will go, but that's, that's just some boats in the wood. You know, so there's that sort of sense of self-doubt about it. I mean, we've got all these series of events on anyway, but it's at what point do you start making artwork for other people? You know, what I try and do with all, all my artworks is try and have sort of different points of entry, so that you know a four-year-old child will be able to appreciate and explore this installation in one way, but a marine biologist will think about it in another, and an art curator will think about it in another, so that. There's enough there for everybody, really. I suppose that all the art projects I create are uh, ideas-driven, so they're, 
they stem from a particular concept um, or a brief that I'm given. And ideas can come from anywhere, I think. You know, I'd be quite happy to, to create an artwork out of a set of ladders, you know. I think we can... I think we're also we're all innovative. We can all come up with ideas in the pub on a Friday night. The trick is being able to take those ideas and actually make them happen. The idea for Sky Orchestra came from visiting uh, Tunisia, and I was staying in a small town on the edge of the desert um, called Douz, right in the south of Tunisia. And in the middle of the night, um, as I was laying in this sort of dark hotel room, a minaret started calling right on the edge of town, and a few minutes later another minaret started calling slightly closer. And after a while there were like ten minarets calling from all different parts of the town right across the city. It was a very beautiful experience. And it just sort of lifted me into this space on the edge of sleep. And I came back to Bristol and I bumped into a hot air balloonist. And it sort of came to me, this idea that actually I could recreate that edge of sleep musical sculptural experience for the public by strapping speakers onto hot air balloons and playing music to affect people's sleep and we would fly over cities um, to sort of inspire people's imaginations. That was probably the first artwork that I made where I realised that actually instead of inviting the public to come into a museum or a, an opera house or a theatre, that actually we can deliver an artistic experience to people's own homes and their own communities. But Luke didn't stop at the artistic experience. He wanted to go deeper. So he contacted an expert on the science of sleep. Luke has an interest in consciousness which again with my sort of psychology background that feeds in. So we were trying to look at what would be the impact of the sounds and how could we maximise, if you like, the pleasant effect of the sounds in terms of people's dream and waking experience. I think our lives are often very regulated now. We live in a you know, high-tech society and we have all these gizmos, but somehow I think Luke often taps into a very fresh new aspect and you have to sort of stand back and say well I kind of know the components but he's put them together and created something that's really different and, and new and, and I think that's, that's one of the best things about what he does. Artist Luke Jerram grew up in a small village in the west of England. As a young boy, he was fascinated by how things worked. I was interested and quite curious in the world around me. I suppose I was one of those kids to take apart the radio, you know, and just try and work out how it was working. I've always had a fascination for perception and how we see the world because I'm colorblind, which actually means that. Um, yeah, my paintings are really awful to begin with, but I, I suppose that, that colour blindness has given me a natural interest in visual perception. Coming from a small village, there wasn't really much going on, really, uh, and I remember going, uh, probably during A-levels, when I was about 18, going to the Tate in Liverpool and seeing a Giacometti exhibition, and there was a little moment of, uh, of sort of spark that occurred that, that I was somehow fascinated. The sculptures that looked ordinary sort of figurative sculptures from one angle and then when you when you look at the artwork from from the front you realize that the sculpture is incredibly thin you know these minute sort of thin figures 
Um, so they were sort of they were playing with perception, I suppose. Um, but there was something there that sort of caught my imagination. Years later, Luke would apply that same fascination to a sculpture of his own. I made uh, Maya through my concern for my daughter's upbringing, uh, perhaps in this digital age that we're in. Um, we all seem to be fused to our little gadgets, our mobile phones uh, that we hold in front of us. So she's there holding and engrossed in her mobile phone, uh, standing on the train station. And the interesting thing is that from a distance it looks like a it does look like a, a little girl standing alone at the, at the station, but as you get closer, the image fragments into all these little cubes. So I was interested in the perceptual sort of phenomena of that. We actually scanned my daughter with an Xbox and took that 3D model and pixelated it. And then the entire artwork was made by water jet cutting layers and layers of aluminium and sticking all those together. We then spent a month putting on little stickers, all the different squares. Um, my wife came over and saw the artwork and said, well, you, you can't use that. And I, because I'm colorblind, I'd, I'd been putting on the odd green sticker. Uh, so I had to take off all the green stickers and I got technicians to do the job properly. Um, but the artwork is now in Bristol Temple Mead Station. At art college I studied sculpture but also performance art. So um, what I find now is that a lot of my art projects have a sort of live art element to them. So they're sculptural but they're, they're sort of live in some way as well. And also when I studied performance we were, you'd often find yourself in an audience looking at a performer on stage. And I realised then that actually the performer was often having the most amount of fun. So there's a number of my art projects now that actually it, it turns the general public into the performer. So with Play Me I'm Yours, the pianos act as a big blank canvas for the public to be creative, and it places the audience at the centre of things to make sure that they have the most amount of fun. Play Me I'm Yours came from um, visiting a laundrette, where I'd see the same people there every weekend sort of washing their clothes, but no one was talking to one another. So I realised then, in a city, there must be all these invisible communities right across a city, people perhaps waiting for a bus together every day or waiting for a train. And they'd recognise each other, but they wouldn't talk. So I thought by putting a piano into that location, it would act as a, a catalyst for conversation to get people talking to one another. And um, in 2007, I installed 15 pianos across Birmingham as part of an art project. Um, and the idea seemed to sort of capture people's imagination somehow. So the pianos are left on the street uh, for, for the public to play for two or three weeks. Um, each piano's got the words, play me, I'm yours on it. So that's an invitation for the public to sit down and engage with it, to say, look, these pianos are, are here for you to sit down and engage with. After the success of his first pianos in Birmingham, Luke took his idea to the world, and it soon became a global phenomenon. We've installed Play Me I'm Yours in, in London, in Los Angeles, New York, Toronto, Sydney and Paris and Geneva. Um, and what's interesting is that the, the experience and the interaction changes from one city to another. So in, in London, people will sit down and play a piano quite shyly, they might film themselves a little bit. Whereas in New York, when we installed 60 pianos across the city, the public would turn up dressed like pop stars and they would be introducing themselves into the camera, sort of pouting, you know, uh, as though it was like a giant X Factor uh, television competition that wanted to be discovered. genuinely wants to engage people through art with um, new experiences and questions about the world that we live in. 
I think often art is kind of seen as a bit sort of distant and a bit aloof and a bit separate from ordinary people. But something which actually engages and creates a conversation and makes you think again about the urban space you live in, I mean, for me, that's something to be applauded. By the end of this year, we'll have installed more than 1,500 pianos in about 50 cities right across the globe. More than 10 million people will have played the pianos over the time. Um, and they've really kind of connected people. In Sao Paulo, we put a piano in a train station, and I came across a, a mother and a, a daughter, and it turns out the mother had worked as a cleaner for four years to be able to send her daughter to piano lessons on the other side of the city. But a piano in Sao Paulo costs about a year's wage, so after working as a cleaner for four years, she'd never actually uh, heard or saw her daughter play the piano. And they came across this piano, and the daughter sat down and played beautiful music for her mother, who burst out into tears. You know, it was a really wonderful thing to witness. And with that art project, you know, we reach so many thousands of people around the world, and it's really kind of connected and changed a lot of people's lives. Um, so I'm quite, yeah, I'm quite proud of that. After finding success with large-scale public engagement artworks, Luke Jerram knows it's not just the art that's important, but the audience too. It's part of the job for me to, as well as making artwork, I also, my job is also to help communicate it and get it commissioned and get it out there and so a lot of people will know about it. So a lot of the artwork I make generates a, a huge amount of both national and international publicity. After the extraordinary public response to his piano installation, Play Me, I'm Yours, Luke decided to embark on his most ambitious artwork yet. Park and Slide came about, um, it was just a small, fun idea, really, uh, that I had, because my office was based on the street uh, where Park and Slide took place, and I thought, in the summertime, wouldn't it be nice during the heat wave to be able to commute home on a giant water slide? In 2014, Luke's vision became a reality. But not even he could have predicted just how big it would become. On the day, we ended up with 60,000 people turning up to, to watch the slide, but also hundreds of journalists, and it led to about 500 news articles that reached more than a billion people around the world. I tried to make the whole event as cheap as possible so that the slide could actually be repeated by other cities around the world. So instead of you know, taking money from advertisers, we decided to yeah, raise the money through crowdfunding instead. And actually it worked really well um, as a way of kind of creating a sense of ownership. People felt like the slide belonged to them. So yeah, it's made people think about their city in a different way and I think that's quite important. I think each artwork that I make sort of expresses a different side of my personality, I suppose. So um, some of the artworks I make are quite generous. It's a gift, you know, to a community. Um, whereas others are uh, perhaps an expression of my interest in, in science or visual perception. The idea for these sculptures came from looking in a newspaper and seeing images of viruses used to illustrate stories of the latest pandemic. So at the moment, we obviously, we've got Ebola that the world is dealing with. Um, and you'd often see a brightly coloured image of Ebola used to illustrate the story. Um, but I realised quite quickly through doing a little bit of research that actually viruses don't have any colour, that, that they're actually smaller than the wavelength of light. So about 10 years ago, I made a small glass sculpture of HIV as something to contemplate and think about. Um, and people seemed to like it. It was bought by a museum. And now it's led to this massive body of glass microbiology artwork uh, that is presented in museums all around the world.
what I'm doing is I'm just making accurate renditions of the virus. They're about a million times larger than the real thing. But it, it makes them incredibly beautiful. So you're attracted to them, but then when you realize that this um, sculpture is actually representing HIV, for instance, you're kind of repelled by it. So that creates a tension, and I suppose I'm interested in that tension. The photographs of these uh, glass sculptures actually have now become part of the vocabulary of virology. So they get used by scientists all the time, go on book covers and to go into medical journals. So it's a sort of, there's an unexpected outcome, I think, to lots of my art projects. Um, and I think a good artwork will do that. As an artist at the moment, I'm managing about 16 different art projects with, uh, that I'm developing concurrently. Um, and they all have their own time scale. It's a bit stressful at times, um, but generally I have a, a lot of fun. A lot of my art projects, they seem sort of disconnected, but there are sort of narratives that connect them. Today, Luke is installing his latest artwork, Withdrawn. He's gone back to his roots and created a large-scale installation that he hopes will spark the public's imagination. I'm interested in the whole experience of an artwork. So for some people, the, the journey towards this artwork will start when they hear about it in the newspaper and they decide to go with their kids and they'll, they might drive up or they'll cycle up to the car park and then there'll be a walk into the woods to get here to discover it with their kids. And, and that journey is all part of the artistic experience really from my perspective. And what you end up with at the end of it is a, a set of memories and it'll be the memories fundamentally that is the, the legacy for this project. And just like Luke's other artworks, today he's attracted a lot of press much to the delight of those who commissioned the piece. Personally, I think it's absolutely exceptional. We're just uh, we're trying to recall if we've ever seen anything quite like this before, um, bringing real-world objects into a woodland. It's a very particular uh, kind of magical experience. We've had the privilege of coming first in this morning, haven't we, and seeing yeah. it as the sun rose. It's been wonderful. The way Luke works is that he's always got like a long list of fabulous ideas, and, you know, things that he'd just love to achieve. He thinks it's about finding the right person at the right time, in the right place, who will just grab it and work with him collaboratively to deliver it. And that's exactly what happened with Withdrawn. I feel like I've just learnt how to be an artist, I suppose. And I'm sort of beginning to sort of open my wings, spread my wings, and get a sense of what I'm capable of doing. To create artwork, it doesn't have to be huge and large scale. It can, you can do sort of outrageous, innovative, groundbreaking artwork on an artwork that's as big as your hand. So it's not always about scale or complexity. It can just be about simple ideas um, that can change the world. Brilliant ideas, powered by Hyundai Motor.